Greetings fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on the Feast of St. Anselm. A little over a thousand years ago, a gentle but brilliant and very stubborn Benedictine built the underpinnings of the bridge that would span the distance between Norman England and the church. His name was Anselm. He was born in the region of Piedmont in northwestern Italy, but by the time God was finished with him, he would follow St. Augustine to become part of the history of Canterbury, the famous see with the famous cathedral in present-day Kent, England, a little east-southeast of London, pretty much against his will, but 100% God's will. Of noble and wealthy parents, young Anselm wanted for nothing. Little is known of his father Gandolfo, save for his worldliness and an inclination to be cranky, but we do know that St. Anselm was blessed with a pious and loving mother. Ermenberga, though she was the daughter of a wealthy and powerful Burgundian dynasty, was a true daughter of the church, and understood that the chief calling of her vocation was to raise her son to save his soul. Though by all accounts her husband hindered rather than helped her, it appears that she did succeed in planting the seeds of piety. When he was fifteen years old, Anselm applied to the local monastery, desirous of devoting his life to God. But in what must have been a frustrating twist to young Anselm, the abbey refused his entrance, fearing the anger of his father. Perhaps that was not the time and the place for him to begin his spiritual journey. God's will hath no why, but sometimes our will throws a wrench in the works. Having been thwarted at his first attempt at a pious vocation, it seems young Anselm threw himself headlong into the world instead, a choice that all too many hopeful mothers throughout the centuries have had to endure. All the wiles and allurements of the world versus a child's weak resolve and unruly temperament a mother's prayers, and here's the game-changer. God, our Father, the persistent shepherd. And you know who wins, because I just called him Saint Anselm. We don't know if there was one particular incident that turned Saint Anselm back to God. If there was one, it's not recorded in the usual places. But after his mother's death, wishing to escape the ordeal of his father's intemperate abuse, he moved to France and in the course of his studies, Anselm came into the sphere of Friar Lanfranc, the prior of Beck, a Benedictine abbey in Normandy. It was during these years in France that Anselm returned to the faith of his childhood and began to consider the religious life again. The whole world had helped lead the boy astray. It had been easy to wander away, it usually is, but it took an enormous amount of strength and humility and the prayers of a pious mother for the man to bend back the course of his will to conform again to God's will and to put behind him the spirits of pride, rebellion, and worldliness. St. Anselm did it, though. He made it back, and he never stopped thanking God for the grace of his reversion, and he never stopped kicking himself for the time wasted. His biographer, his friend and disciple Edmer, tells us, quote, The saint, in his genuine meditations, expresses the deepest sentiments of compunction for these disorders, which his perfect spirit of penance exceedingly exaggerated to him, and which, like another David, he never ceased most bitterly to bewail to the end of his days, end quote. St. Anselm took his monastic vows in the Benedictine order at Beck Monastery in about the year 1060. Recognized immediately for his great intellectual ability and his sincere piety, it was not long before he rose to the rank of prior of the abbey. Abbot Lanfranc, having since become the abbot of Cayenne, St. Anselm eventually became abbot of Beck in 1078. Under his watch, Beck became a renowned seat of monastic learning. As respected a theologian as Abbot Lefranc had been, Anselm surpassed him. He is known today as the father of scholasticism, and, notabene, 
There is no easy definition of the word scholasticism. There are four and a half pages dedicated to the subject in the 1907 Catholic Encyclopedia in teeny tiny print. But the clearest summary might be that, quote, Scholastics used their reason. They applied dialectic to the study of nature, of human nature, and of supernatural truth. Far from depreciating reason, they went as far as man can go in the application of reason to the discussion of the dogmas of the faith. End quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. You might call St. Anselm a forerunner of St. Albert the Great and St. Thomas Aquinas, fellow doctors of the Church, and the two most famous scholastic philosophers of the Church. Looking even closer, it was St. Anselm who began what came to be known as the ontological argument that the existence of God can be deduced by analyzing the concept of God, a philosophical train of thought that St. Thomas famously delved into a century and a half later. Another of St. Anselm's famous works, Cordeus Homo, or Why Did God Become Man, became the classic dissertation on the redemption Completed in 1099, St. Anselm somehow managed to complete the manuscript in the middle of constant ongoing politics and strife, so convoluted that it almost defies description. In a nutshell, though, William the Conqueror, he who established Norman rule over England in 1066, and if that date rings a bell, you might be remembering the Battle of Hastings, a key moment in history that signaled the end of Anglo-Saxon rule in England. William the Conqueror happened to be a benefactor of the monastery at Beck, which, remember, is in Normandy, where the Normans come from. In addition to these French lands, William had donated some holdings in England as well, where, of course, St. Anselm arranged for the founding of several Benedictine abbeys. Over the course of time, he made several visits to England to supervise these abbeys. On the occasion of one such excursion, specifically to the Priory in Chester in 1092, William II, who I'm inclined to want to dub William the Blighter, a medieval word for jerk, who had succeeded his father, William the Conqueror, was causing all sorts of problems in Canterbury. Now, though the original William, William the Conqueror, was considered a friend of the Benedictines, at least most of the time, and treated St. Anselm with particular deference. His son, William II, also called William Rufus, also called William the Blighter, was sacrilegious and tyrannical. According to St. Anselm's biographer, Edmer, quote, William Rufus usurped the revenues of vacant benefices and deferred his permission as to the filling of the Episcopal sees that he might the longer enjoy their income. Having thus seized into his hands the revenues of the archbishopric, he reduced the monks of Canterbury to a scanty allowance, oppressing them moreover by his officers with continual insults, threats, and vexations. He had been solicited by the most virtuous amongst the nobility to supply the See of Canterbury in particular with a person proper for that station. But William continued deaf to all their remonstrances, and answered them that neither Anselm nor any other should have that bishopric while he lived. And this he swore by the holy face upon the great crucifix in the cathedral. End quote. Almost immediately, William was seized with a violent illness, and near death felt God's governing hand figuratively around his throat. In an attempt to appease his maker and save his own life, he hastened to sign a proclamation that released all political prisoners, forgave all debts to the crown, promised, in short, to govern according to the law, and he nominated Anselm to the See of Canterbury. But St. Anselm had no intention whatsoever of bending to the will of a tyrannical king over the rightful process of appointment, and he refused the post. The king, desperate because he thought he was going to die, persisted in his demand that St. Anselm take the job. And the people of Canterbury insisted with him. I mean, how could they do better than to have so holy a priest standing between them and such a king? In the end, the archbishopric was impressed practically by force upon the poor abbot, our Anselm, and because he loved the people, he reluctantly accepted it with provisions. As Edmer puts it, quote, 
Thereupon they forced a pastoral staff into his hands, in the king's presence carried him into the church, and sang the Te Deum on the occasion. This was on the 6th of March, 1093. He still declined the charge, till the king had promised him the restitution of all lands that were in the possession of that see in Lefranc's time, and some also insisted that he should acknowledge Urban II as lawful pope. Things being thus adjusted, Anselm was consecrated with great solemnity on the 4th of December in 1093. Alas, though, William recovered, having learned nothing. Reverting pretty much instantly to his treacherous and greedy ways, and missing the income he'd been used to receiving from Canterbury, he sent forth to the cathedral a missive demanding a large sum of money from the sea, which Anselm refused to pay. In response, William refused to allow Anselm to go to Rome to receive the pallium from Pope Urban II. Nota bene, a pallium is an ecclesiastical mantle or cloak that is the symbol of papal approval of an appointment. So, back and forth, the controversy continued for two years, with Anselm basically held captive in England. In 1095, in a curious turn of events, the English bishops sided with the king over St. Anselm, which must have really annoyed our saint. But to give them the benefit of the doubt, perhaps the bishops were just desperate to return to normalcy. There's no telling. When the pallium arrived from Rome, however, St. Anselm refused to accept it from William. He had never agreed to this modus operandi, and he refused to allow any shadow of an appearance that he owed his spiritual and ecclesiastical authority to the king. So, eventually, King William the Blighter permitted St. Anselm to leave for Rome. But, go figure, it was not, in fact, a good faith gesture. Before his ship had disappeared over the horizon, William had seized the lands of the Sea of Canterbury. St. Anselm continued to suffer the monarchy's interference in ecclesiastical matters for several years, a bad habit that continued under the reign of William's successor, Henry I, in the midst of which St. Anselm endured a three-year banishment from Canterbury before the problem was settled, sort of, at least for a little while, by the Synod of Westminster in 1107. Now, imagine this. All this time, St. Anselm had been working on his treaties about our Lord's redemption of man, and who knows how many other works on diverse subjects. It's said that in addition to his philosophical and theological studies, St. Anselm excelled in the understanding of metaphysics and the sciences in general. He never stopped studying. He is also famous for his devotion to and his writing about our Blessed Mother, whose Feast of the Immaculate Conception he was the first to establish locally in the West. All this, remember, in addition to the myriad of pastoral duties of a priest and archbishop. After the Synod of Westminster, St. Anselm did get to enjoy two years of relative peace before his death in Canterbury in 1109. But you can be sure he was never idle. To the very end, he remained conscious of the responsibility to make up for that lost time in his youth. The significance of all of this. In claiming that the king had no right to interfere in ecclesiastical matters, Anselm became a major figure in what we now know as the investiture controversy. The question of whether a secular ruler has the primary right to vest an ecclesiastical authority, such as a bishop, with the symbols of his office a conflict we see carried out again, but in even more dramatic fashion, less than 100 years later between King Henry II and St. Thomas Becket. It was St. Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury from 1162 to 1170, a martyr to the investiture controversy, who referred St. Anselm's cause of beatification to Rome for consideration. Pope Clement XI declared St. Anselm a doctor of the church in 1720. St. Anselm is frequently depicted with a symbol of his archbishopric, a mitre, a pallium, and crozier, as well as a book signifying that he is a doctor of the church. You will also see a ship in his iconography, representing the freedom and independence of the church, those qualities of which St. Anselm is the patron. What, you might ask now, was St. Anselm like as a person? His biographer, who knew him personally, wrote of him, quote, he became a member of the house at Beck at the age of 27. 
in 1060 under the abbot Herlion. Three years after, Lefranc was made abbot at St. Stephen's, and Anselm became prior of Beck. At his promotion, several of the monks murmured on account of his youth, but by patience and sweetness he won the affection of all, and by little condescensions at first, so worked upon an irregular young monk called Osborne, as to perfect his conversion and make him one of the most fervent of the monks. In regard to the management and tutoring of youth, he looked upon excessive severity as highly pernicious. Edmer continues, Amidst his troubles and public distractions, he retired often in the day to his devotions, and watched long in them in the night. At his meals and at all times he conversed interiorly in heaven. One day, as he was riding to his manor at Hearse, a hare pursued by the dogs ran under his horse for refuge, at which the saint stopped, and the hounds stood at bay. The hunters laughed, but the saint said, weeping, this hair puts me in mind of a poor sinner, just upon the point of departing this life, surrounded with devils, waiting to carry away their prey. The hare going off, he forbade her to be pursued, and was obeyed, not a hound stirring after her. In like manner, every object served to raise his mind to God, with whom he always conversed in his heart, and in the midst of noise and tumult, he enjoyed the tranquility of holy contemplation. So strongly was his soul sequestered from and raised above the world. Two of the more famous quotes of our saint. Remove grace, and you have nothing whereby to be saved. Remove free will, and you have nothing that could be saved. And another. For I do not seek to understand in order to believe, but I believe in order to understand. For I believe this. Unless I believe, I will not understand. And last but not least, here is a sermon by St. Anselm on Our Lady. Blessed Lady, sky and stars, earth and rivers, day and night, everything that is subject to the power or use of man, rejoice that through you they are in some sense restored to their lost beauty and are endowed with the inexpressible new grace. All creatures were dead, as it were, useless for men or for the praise of God who made them. The world, contrary to its true destiny, was corrupted and tainted by the acts of men who served idols. Now all creation has been restored to life and rejoices that it is controlled and given splendor by men who believe in God. The universe rejoices with new and indefinable loveliness. Not only does it feel the unseen presence of God himself, its creator, it sees him openly working and making it holy. These great blessings spring from the blessed fruit of Mary's womb. Through the fullness of the grace that was given you, dead things rejoice in their freedom, and those in heaven are glad to be made new. Through the Son, who was the glorious fruit of your virgin womb, just souls who died before his life-giving death rejoice as they are freed from captivity, and the angels are glad at the restoration of their shattered domain. Lady, full and overflowing with grace, all creation receives new life from your abundance. Virgin, blessed above all creatures, through your blessing all creation is blessed. Not only creation from its creator, but the creator himself has been blessed by creation. To Mary God gave his only begotten Son, whom he loved as himself. Through Mary God made himself a Son, not different, but the same, by nature Son of God and Son of Mary. The whole universe was created by God, and God was born of Mary. God created all things, and Mary gave birth to God. The God who made all things gave himself form through Mary, and thus he made his own creation. He who could create all things from nothing would not remake his ruined creation without Mary. God, then, is the father of the created world, and Mary the mother of the recreated world. God is the father by whom all things were given life, and Mary the mother through whom all things were given new life. For God begot the Son, through whom all things were made, 
and Mary gave birth to him as the Savior of the world. Without God's Son, nothing could exist. Without Mary's Son, nothing could be redeemed. Truly the Lord is with you, to whom the Lord granted that all nature should owe as much to you as to himself. Mater Dei, ora pro nobis. Blessed be God, in his angels and in his saints. Amen.